the presentation of the Rio Grande Oil Company. Please calling all cars, attention all cars, the sheriff's office. Broadcast 65, regarding a train wreck and a robbery in Mint Canyon. The threat described as tall, thin, wearing a mask. That's all. Rolls and put it. dramatization of the wreck of old 59. With us in the studio are the men who escaped a painful death in that wreck of the S.P. Scratch Flyer. Engineer R.C. Ball and his fireman R.C. Fowler. They are here to live over again with you the most thrilling experience of their lives. Tonight's story is described in the February issue of the Calling All Cars News. A unique publication given away by all service stations selling Rio Grande cracked gasoline. If you have not already driven in and asked for your free copy of the Calling All Cars News, do so tonight or tomorrow. There is no obligation. You need buy nothing. And you will find tonight's broadcast doubly enjoyable when you also read the true story and see the picture. Get the habit of going to your neighborhood Rio Grande dealer the first of every month and getting your free copy of this unusual publication. It contains the latest movie news, previews, and photos of new films. Read the sensational true story of Gene Harlow's life. And there's a radio guide to help you find the best programs on the air. And a theater guide. This periodical is only one sample of the free services you get from your Rio Grande dealer. When you buy Rio Grande cracked gasoline, you get Tetra Ethyl plus extra power, plus extra speed at no extra cost. When you buy Sinclair Opaline motor oil, you get an oversized quart for a quarter, two extra ounces free. Rio Grande's remarkable growth in sales proves that Rio Grande dealers offer the best value in this market. Tonight we had hoped to present as our guest officer, Sheriff Eugene Distelou of Los Angeles County. But a summons from the governor has taken him to Sacramento. And he has delegated as his representative the hero of tonight's case. An officer who followed his man across half a dozen states and finally brought him to earth in Oklahoma. Presenting Captain Tom Higgins from the Sheriff's Office of Los Angeles County. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I guess I'll have quite a time living up to that send-off Dr. Lindsay just gave me. To tell the truth, I'd much rather be chasing the toughest train record in the country than standing up in front of this mocking little brown microphone. Casey Jones, my partner, and I got quite a kick out of running down the man who wrecked the West Coast Limited. I guess the case developed on hunches. Those things that officers often get, but can't quite explain. Of one thing I'm very sure, if the boys in the sheriff's office hadn't chipped in with their hard-earned dough to finance me for the trip, the chances are that burning the train wrecker would never have been cut so soon. But I'm getting way ahead of the story. Just sit tight and you'll hear all about it. A few minutes past six o'clock on the evening of November 10th, 1929, the SP Track Flyer, the West Coast Limited, pulls out of Los Angeles down for Portland. Slowly the long train cuts up Alameda Street through the garish lights of Chinatown, rattles over the siding, stops briefly at Glendale and Burbank. San Fernando, once left behind, 
The limited gathers up speed for the long dash across the Mojave Desert. The fog has slipped past the clear windows. A blur of light. As the engine whistled, last the black. The flyer is doing better than 50 miles an hour as it roars around the gentle curve behind Snowy Fisher's land. A life serpent of light. Its fiery head shooting sparks to the yellow stars above. Inside the train, more than a hundred passengers enjoy the comfort of curious travel. Dining from clean white women in the dining room. Reading the latest magazines in the club car. Serene and confident that they will be speedily delivered to their destination. And then... The track plows into a ditch, carrying tender and hard after. Escaping steam hisses about the trapped engineer and fireman. A broken fuel line bursts into flames. In the dining car, passengers are hurled from the table, scalded with hot liquid. The lights go out. Women, the lights go out. Women scream, men shout. Terror descends on the desert. Through the darkened car, strides the conductor, seeking to quiet the hysterical pass. About folks, not in the We haven't been able to find out exactly yet, ma'am, but the engine jumped the track. All the cars are still upright. Oh, I'm not going to get me a light in here. My wife's seen it. Sorry, sir, you'll have to get her outside. We opened the doors on the right hand side. Why? George, you rascal. What are you doing in there? Oh, I'm saying my prayers, boss. I'll just stand to meet the maker. Lawrence, if you get out of there and help those passengers off the car. Oh, I'm scared to do that, boss. Something awful's going to happen. Something awful will happen to you if you don't get out of there and do as I say. Yeah, 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 oh. All right. Step out this way. Oh, look here, Conductor. Delay is going to cost me money. The railroad company will have to deliver me and Portland on schedule. Well, they'll hear from me. I can't do anything about that, sir. From the looks of this thing, we're lucky we're alive. How about it, George? The passengers are all out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll send the engine. Okay, coming up. Nobody's going up to the front of this train. Well, who are you? Well, I who I am. This was my calling card. All right, folks, line up against the car and reach for the sky. This is a hold-up and I mean business. Oh, I say just like the cinema. Really the wild west, isn't it? All right, turn the chatter and tell out. I'm in a hurry. Come on, you fork over. You too, ma'am. All right. Give me that first. Here it is. Here, miss, I don't want your ticket, just your dough. There's a doctor down there. The engineer is pretty badly burnt. Hey, you conductor. Tell him to hold his horse. But, but, I... Go on, go on. All right. I'll send somebody up in a minute. Well, hurry up. He's in a bad way. Look here. I'm a doctor. Let me go up there where I need it. Okay, but kick in first. Very well. That's everything I have on me. All right. Now stand up there, then. All right, ladies. Let's have your dough. You too, mister. Well, they didn't waste much time getting the call in. That's time to buy invitations to scram, my friend. Thank you all for your contributions, and I hope I ever caused any too much convenience. Again, my thanks, and good night. The engineer, suffering from painful burns, is quickly taken to a hospital, and a relief train dispatched from Los Angeles returns to battered and shaken passengers, none of whom have been seriously injured. All night long, a posse of deputy sheriffs and ranchers home the hills for a trace of the train robber. But as day breaks from the wreckage of the West Coast Limited, no sign of the criminal has been found. With the coming of light, the investigating officers make a closer inspection of the scene. Yeah, whoever did this job knew his railroading. How come? He pulled the spikes that held the fish plates to the tires. The rails were loosened and they spread when the train went over them. But notice he didn't touch the tire wires connecting the rails. What are they for? They're part of the signal system. If they were shorted, the blocks would automatically have been shut off to warn the limited. Hmm, smart guy, huh? You bet he was. But I can't savvy why he went to all these pains for the three hundred dollars or so he lifted from the passengers. He didn't even try to rob the mail cars. Maybe he's too smart to monkey with a federal one. Yeah, maybe. Hey, John, do something to me, huh? What? Gordon Cope. Searching party just brought it in. Well, that's it. Yeah. No identification on it. Might be anybody's coat. Well, we better interview some of the passengers and see if they can identify him. <laughs> w. 
several passengers do identify the coat as the same worn by the bandit. And in addition, add the frugal information that the man had a thin face and freckles. With such meager information, the manhunt is prosecuted with little success. Then, about a week later, on a ranch near Riverside... Hey, Joe, come over here. Get a good laugh. Yes, he's trying to tell me how tough he is. Yeah, what's he saying? He says he's a good friend of a lot of safe crackers in Los Angeles. Yeah, well, you come down to L.A. with me. I'll show you. I'm in the know down there. They got respect <laughs> for me. Yeah. You're such a hard guy. Tell me out here, glamming on. Oh, I got a job in the groves to lay low for a while. You know how it is. Sure, sure. What's your specialty, Les? Pick up the good thing, Marty. Oh, I ain't particular. I handle the rod pretty good. And I'm not bad at wrecking trains. Yeah. Huh? Well, you wrecked that train last week, huh? You never can tell, boys. You never can tell. Sure. Maybe they're trying to tell the truth, huh? I don't think so. Well, maybe he ain't lying, Joe. So. Maybe we should tell the cops, huh? Tell the cops what for? Yes, sabe. Maybe there's a big reward for him. Hmm. Well, it won't hurt none to find out. I don't like him much anyhow. <laughs> Bright orange picker is arrested and closely questioned by several deputy sheriffs. After some time, he confesses. Sure, I did it. I broke open a section two of it and tried to spice loose. But I wasn't in the holdup. You were, huh? Why not? Well, I happened to run into a couple of guys when I was bumming down from bake to lunch. They propositioned me to fix the track. They gave me 250 bucks for the job and told me to beat it. Oh, are they? I don't know their name. Well, what did they look like? Well, one was about 40. He, he had gray hair and black eyes and was about my build. Mm. Yeah, and, and the other was younger. He had light hair and blue eyes and he was about five feet four. Remember anything else about them? Well, only does the young guy wore a torn coat. Do you realize in ripping those rails that you might have killed a lot of innocent people? Yeah. Yeah, I might have a dead, mightn't I? Well, what did you do it for? Two hundred and fifty bucks. Uh, take him back to his cell, Sergeant. Yes, come on. Well, boys, I guess this closes our case. We've all worked hard, and I want to thank you for your splendid cooperation. Mm. Well, maybe the sheriff is satisfied, Tom, but I'm not. I don't think me pulled this job. I've been thinking the same thing, Casey. Let's follow this thing through. I've got a hunch I'd like to work on. What is it? I think this guy Meade is a nut. And there is something screwy about the way he talks, and there's a goofy look in his eyes. All right. So let's do a little off-the-record investigating. First, we'll send his description, mugged and prints to every bug house on the Pacific Coast. Deputy Sheriff Higgins and Jones are right. Their query receives a reply from the Medical Lake Asylum at Spokane, Washington, that Meade is an escaped inmate of the institution. This discovery reopens the case. Newspapers again devote columns of space to the story and carry the legal description of the train robber. The newspaper stories send an excited young woman into the sheriff's office, where Higgins and Jones interview her. I think I saw the man who wrecked that train. You did? When? The night of the wreck. My father gave him a lift into Hollywood. What? Yes. And he had a thin face, I suppose, for sure. Now, just you know, a minute, miss. Please start at the beginning and tell us just what happened. Well, we live in Burbank. And on the night of the wreck, my father and mother and my sister Helene and I were driving into Los Angeles when a man hailed us. Yes. Yeah. Father stopped the car and he got in the back seat with sister and me. He said he'd been in a train wreck, and he'd like to be driven to the Hollywood Hospital if we were going that way. Where was this? Between Burbank and Magnolia Park. Yes, but the wreck occurred near Saugus. Well, he said he must have been out of his head and wandered across the hill. He said he didn't remember a thing from the time the train jumped the track till he came to the road where we picked him up. Helene and I wanted to go back and see the wreck, but this man said he was hurt pretty bad. So father said he'd best send to the hospital. But he had a thin face, just like the paper said. And did he have freckles? Well, he had little spots on his face. They might be mistaken for freckles in the dark. Anything else you noticed about his appearance? Why, yes. Yes. Yes, he had a drooping eyelid. 
Fuller's eyelid, I think it was. A drooping eyelid, thin face, liver spot. I got it, Casey, I got it. Got what? I know who pulled this job and also pulled the train robbery in Wyoming last week. You mean the one that was assembly to the SC zone? Yeah. Well, who is it? It's... Wait a minute, that's so fast. Let's get an identification from this young lady. Just a second till I go through this mug book. I got them. We know who wrecked the West Coast Limited. You do? Yes, sir. And it's the same guy who wrecked the Union Pacific Portland Flyer in his Cheyenne last week. Well, who is he? Tom Vernon, three-time loser. Oh. He ran a donkey engine in the prison yard while he was at Folsom. Hmm. I set him up the last time. He came to see me when he got out last month. Said he was going straight. Apparently, he has. I've been awful dumb about this. I should have connected him with this thing before. Well, how are you sure he did it? Just talked to a girl whose father gave him a lift from Burbank into L.A. a few hours after the wreck. Mm -hmm. He identified his mug and his description tallied with those furnished by the victim. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the payoff. I got a letter from Vernon from Denver on the 14th, telling me he had left Los Angeles on the morning of November 10th to look for work in Denver. Mm -hmm. Now, the 10th was the day of the West Coast Limited wreck. Hmm. And Vernon was trying to build up an alibi. Yeah, well, the tackle of the bus lines and trains would prove whether you're right. Yeah, Jones and I will make that check. But I know I'm right. And if I do find he left after the wreck, will you let me go to Denver and bring you back? Well, Tom, I'd sure like to, but we haven't any funds for that purpose. No funds? What do you mean? Dean Biscalouse went all the way to Honduras for Clara Phillips. Where well, do you see, Tom? The state law says that you can have any amount of money to travel to another state, or even to another country, to bring back a fugitive already under arrest. But there are no funds available for expenses of officers seeking evidence or apprehending a mere suspect. Well, all I got to say is that's a screwy law. Well, unfortunately, we can't do anything about it. If I had any money of my own, I'd pay my own way. The only thing we can do is to ask Denver to pick Vernon up. And they'd probably muff it. They don't know the guy. I do. I'm sorry, Tom. That's all we can do. What a nice eight ball that puts us behind. <laughs> Higgins' partner quickly unsnarls the legal knot by informing the deputies of the robbery squad of the situation. Within five minutes, they raise a purse of $200 and pledge that much more so that Higgins may go to Denver and bring back his man. A check on the bus terminal reveals that Vernon left Los Angeles for Denver at midnight on November 10th, four hours after the wreck, instead of on the morning of the 10th, as he had claimed. Higgins loses no time in getting to Denver, and there, with the assistance of acting captain of detectives James Maxwell, he searches the rooming houses and hotels of the Colorado capital. Finally, um, got anyone registered here by the name of Vernon? Vernon? Vernon, eh? Let me see. When would you come in? November 11th, probably. No, no, there's nobody here with that name. Hmm. Anyone been here in the past couple of weeks that looks like this picture? Uh, sure. Well, they didn't use the name of Vernon. Said his name was Harley. Then, yeah, is he in now? No, he checked out about a week ago. Said he's going to Cheyenne. Cheyenne, oh? <laughs> well, it looks like I'm just beginning to travel. Higgins boards the next train for Cheyenne, and upon his arrival in the Wyoming city, pays a call upon Sheriff G. H. Loman of Laramie County. Uh, Sheriff. I just dropped in to tell you how it's in town. What brings you up this neck of the woods, Higgins? I'm looking for Tom Vernon. Tom Vernon? I'm looking for him, too. Yeah, that's what I figured. Well, it might surprise you to know he's right here in Cheyenne. What? That's what they told me in Denver. Well, now, uh, where is he? That's what I'm going to find out. I'll go with you. I don't need any help. You got a warrant for his arrest? No. Well, I have. It couldn't end without me if you did find him. Well, I guess you're right there. Well, I'm not going to let that $10,000 reward slip through my fingers without trying for it. Okay, Sheriff. We might as well work together as lose time arguing about a reward we haven't earned yet. But the search in Cheyenne merely results in the information that Vernon has returned to Denver. Higgins hops a train for the city, and to his great disgust, Sheriff Ronza accompanies him. Arriving in Denver, Higgins ducks Ronza, and tired out, goes to the nearest rooming house. He spends the rest of the night, 
and next morning is studying his notes for the case when the chambermaid comes to clear up the room. She is cleaning an ashtray when her gaze falls on Vernon's picture thrown carelessly on the dresser. Well, the painful place. What's the matter? How come you to be having a picture of Mr. Vernon? Do you know him? Indeed, I do, and a nicer man you never met. It's handsome that he does. He's staying here? No, he left a couple of days ago. He's gone down to Oklahoma. Yeah, where in Oklahoma? Well, he told me to forward his mail to Pawnee, Oklahoma. He's down there visiting a circus man called Pawnee Bill. Thanks, that's just fine. <laughs> well, for the love of heaven, what are you throwing all those things back into your bag for? I suddenly remembered I got to catch a train for Oklahoma. Oh, and here's a dollar for being such a good chambermaid. <laughs> Higgins spends the hour before train time at the Denver Police Headquarters. Here once more, he runs into Sheriff Lonzo, who somehow hears his destination. When the train pulls out of Denver for, for Pawnee, Higgins is again disgusted to find Lonzo aboard. That night at a Kansas way station, Higgins wires Jones, his partner, begging him to get a warrant sworn out for Burns' arrest. Jones steps right on the job, and the next morning, when Higgins and Lonzo arrive at the Pawnee jail... Uh, good morning, Marshal. I'm Deputy Sheriff Higgins of Los Angeles County. This is Sheriff Rumsey of Laramie County, Wyoming. Ah, well, we well, need you, gentlemen. Thanks. Uh, we're holding Vernon a prisoner here for you, Higgins. Well, huh? Lodge 12. He's my man, Marshal. Well, you see, Sheriff, we got a warrant telegraphed to us last night from Los Angeles County asking us to arrest this Vernon fella. So, we went out and got him. <laughs> uh, so the march in that time, Rumsey. You haven't got your man yet. But I'm going to get him. Look here, Higgins. If I take that man back to Wyoming, we'll hang him. We've got a death penalty for train wrecking in California. Yeah, but I happen to know that no one's ever been executed for train wrecking in your state. I promise you we'll demand the death penalty in this case. I'm not sure that you'll get it, though. I know this man will swing in Wyoming. Well, I'm not going to give him up to you. You haven't got him yet. You're not to extradite. We will. Maybe you will, and maybe you won't. Now, I want you to know that the governor of Wyoming has just gotten back from a two week hunting trip. He's a guest of the governor of Oklahoma. That ought to make some difference. Yeah, it ought to. But we'll see whether it does or not. <laughs> District Attorney's Office. Pawnee, Oklahoma. Call you from the Just a minute, please. Long distance, sir. Who is it? I don't know. Pawnee, Oklahoma, the operator said. I'll tell you. Hello? Mr. Smith? Yes. Yeah. Just a minute, please. Go ahead, sir. Hello, Bureau. Yeah, who's this? Tom Higgins, Bureau. Oh, yes, Tom. I'm down here in Pawnee, Oklahoma, and I've got Tom Vernon in jail. But Wyoming's starting extradition proceedings right away. It seems the governor of Wyoming and the governor of Oklahoma are buddies. Now, don't worry about that. I'll take care of things. You sit tight, and I'll see you in the morning. In the morning? How can you get here that quick? Don't worry about that, too, Tom. Great work, old man. See you tomorrow. Now, get the sheriff's office on the wire. Tell him to send a man by plane to Sacramento and get Governor Young to sign extradition papers returning Tom Vernon to California. Then get the governor on the phone, and I'll talk to him myself. Is my bag packed? Yes, sir. It'll all be here. Good. Now, call Western Air Express and arrange to charter a plane to take me to Pawnee, Oklahoma. When do you want to leave? I don't see four hours. As soon as the man gets back here from Sacramento with those papers. <laughs> Pawnee Jail, Sheriff Ronza has tried to steal a march on Higgins. He has been grilling Vernon hour after hour. Might as well stop lying, Vernon. You did that job at Cheyenne. You're crazy. I wasn't anywhere near Cheyenne when that job was well, Where were you? In Denver. When that had happened, I spent at a rooming house near the station. I tell you, I'm clean. How well, do you know where you were on the particular night of the robbery? Because I was sitting in the lobby and heard them tell about it over the radio. You're lying, Vernon. It's all a lie. It won't work. You left Los Angeles on the night of the 10th. You started for Denver, yeah. You stopped off at Cheyenne and you pulled that job on the way. Had to be that way. You left in the midnight train on the 10th. But I didn't, see? I left on the morning train. And I can prove yeah, it. Yeah, how? By a good friend of yours, Higgins. Higgins? You're nuts. I am, huh? Well, then ask him if he didn't get a letter from me. Sent from Denver on the 14th. Well, why'd you write to him? Never mind that. The important thing is that I did. And in that letter, I told him I'd left on the morning train. I am he. Well, Rumpa, you might have let me know that you were going to put Vernon on the map. What is this, Higgins? Vernon says he has an alibi to prove he couldn't have done either of the train jobs. It's your it. 
I admit, some literary sensitive proved he left there before that job was done and came straight to Denver. And you got it, too, didn't you, Higgins? Well, now, what do you know about that? By George Bromsa, he's right. You mean to tell me you had me chasing this guy all over the country when you knew he had a cast iron alibi? It looks that way, Bromsa. You know, I'm surprised that a smart guy like you was taken in. And you mean I'm free to go? Perfectly free, Vernon, except for one thing. It just happens that I've known you long enough to know you're a liar as well as a crook. So I checked the trains and buses out of L.A. on the 10th. You didn't leave there on the morning of the 10th. You left at midnight, four hours after the Saugus job was over. What's your idea of all this? Has he got an alibi or hasn't he? Sure he's got an alibi. An alibi he wrote himself, and it's as phony as he is. Now listen here, Vernon. I can assure you we've got a case against you that you can't beat. We've got a positive identification from the family that gave you a lift into Hollywood. And you'll be able to identify you half a dozen times over as soon as those victims see you. The simplest thing for you to do is to come clean. Okay, Higgins. You've always been square to me. I'll wreck the train and held up the passenger. And after you made you get away from Los Angeles, you went to Denver, then to Cheyenne. We erect the Union Pacific Fire on November 25th. I did not. Don't lie to me. You can't prove it. I wouldn't be so sure about that. I've got a case against you you can't beat. You're going to hang for this, whether you confess or not. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm willing to admit something I did. Sure, I wrecked the SP train, but I didn't do nothing else. Why did you wreck the train, Vernon? I thought you told me you were going straight. Oh, I was. I tried to get a job from the SP as a fireman. They wouldn't take me on when they discovered I was an ex-con. So I got sore and figured I'd get back at them by wrecking the train. What about all those innocent people you might have killed? Guess I didn't think much about that. So you just wrecked the train for revenge, huh? Yeah, that's all. What about the robbery? Well, I, I didn't intend to rob the passengers, but when I saw the confusion, it seemed too easy, so I took as many of them as I could before the cops arrived. When you found out how easy it was to wreck trains, you tried it again 15 days later in Cheyenne. I didn't. You can't make me say that. I don't know what you're putting into this thing for. I committed a crime in California, and I'm going back there to face trial. Maybe you are, and maybe you're going to Cheyenne to hang. The following morning, Buren Pitts flies into Pawnee. Higgins, Ramza, and he are quickly closeted with the governor of Oklahoma who listens quietly to the pleas of California and Wyoming for the prisoner. Your Excellency, this criminal has confessed his crime in California. He belongs to us. We will surely convict him and put him away where he can no longer threaten society. If this man remains alive, he'll always be a threat to society. Give him to Wyoming and we'll hang him. Uh, we can speedily convict him on his own confession. Wyoming would have to conduct a costly trial. We don't care how much a trial it costs. We're still enough in the end. You confess to the California crime because he's afraid of the death penalty. I will promise you this. If Vernon is returned to California, and if by any chance we should fail to obtain a conviction, we will turn him over to Wyoming. Well, gentlemen, uh, I've heard enough of the case to see that only one course is clear. What is that, sir? The California crime occurred prior to the Wyoming crime. Therefore, California has a prior right to the criminal. Surely, Sheriff, you can have no objections in view of Mr. Pitt's promise to turn the criminal over to you if he fails to obtain a conviction? I want to see this man hung. Oh, I'm afraid we must let justice take its course. The only fair solution to the situation is to award the criminal to the state of California, which I am sure will see justice done in this case as she always has in the past. <laughs> After he had wrecked the West Coast Limited, Tom Vernon was locked in a cell in Los Angeles County Jail. Although dis the district attorney delivered an impassioned plea for the death penalty, Judge William Tell Agley sentenced the train wrecker to life imprisonment in Folsom Penitentiary. Being a three time loser under the California Habitual Criminal Act, Vernon may never receive either probation or parole and must spend the rest of his days behind prison walls. Thank you, Captain Higgins. Oh, 
And in California, all police cars and fire engines operated by the city of Oakland are to use only Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Never Copa County, Arizona. Attention all sheriff's cars. Official orders. You are to use Rio Grande cracked gasoline exclusively in all emergency equipment. Berkeley, California. Fire engines, police cars, ambulances, attention. Your city specifies that only Rio Grande cracked gasoline shall be used in emergency equipment. Los Angeles, California. For the third consecutive year, this city has decided that Rio Grande cracked gasoline is the only one to be used for all police cars, fire engines, and emergency equipment. Use no other gasoline. <laughs> Thank you.